Hi folks, my name is Bob Venturini and you're watching An Hour with Bob. My guest today is a guy that's been on the show a couple times before in different, I don't know, different faculties. He's, uh, he was a state police commander, a, a, a colonel, and then he was the head of the YMCA and now he's here as a very, very successful lacrosse coach at LaSalle. They just won their 11th, is that true? That's 11th? true. Steve O'Donnell, nice to, nice to see you again. Yeah, thank you for having me. Always a pleasure talking to you. It's always a pleasure to have you on. You're one of my favorite, don't tell anybody, but yeah, you're one of my yeah. favorite <laughs> guests. Uh, 11 straight, that's very difficult to do for, in any sport, to win 11 straight Yeah, it's a, pr it's a proud moment. It happened on um, Saturday night, right? 5.30 at Brown University. It's... Um, you know, there's a lot that goes to it, Bob. As you know, we talk sports and your success with baseball, but it's, um, it's a kid-driven business. You know, I have 18-year-olds through 15, 15 to 18. Right. That each year, it's a new group. Sometimes the kids were there the year before. Um, I think the success is based on, um, we call it um, buy-in and battle. You've got to buy into philosophy right. and right. you've got to battle. And what I mean by is we have a philosophy where, you know, it, it's just little things. Coming to practice on time doing the right thing in the classroom. What I would like to mention is 36 of our varsity players, which is almost all of them, right. are academic all state, which means they're 3-0 or better. Nice. And that's, you know, that's, that's exactly. Huge. That's huge. That's the absolute opposite of what most football teams are, especially college. Yeah, well, it's, it's, to me, that's, the, that's what they're there for. Right. You know, when lacrosse ends. Lacrosse you know, is a secondary. Yeah. You're, you're teaching them. Life skills. The right way. Like, yeah, life skills. Yeah, and honestly, I don't take any credit for the academic. That's the school. Right. The school philosophy is awesome. Um, we have a study hall for the kids because we don't practice till night because it's just not feasible to me to get to LaSalle at 2.30 in the afternoon based on my former life right. and the life I live now. So, um, Plus, we can't be on the field and shooting lacrosse balls when the track team is there because that those balls travel pretty fast. I These was going to get can, into that. Yeah, this is a <laughs> solid rubber ball that kids shoot in the 90s. I was just, yes, yeah, I, I heard that. It's in, in the 90s. That's it, pretty, that's like a, a major league fastball. Yeah, it is. Right? And, you know, I got Cody who coaches with me. We, he shot 112. He played professionally. So think of that ball coming out of your wow. stick. And that hits somebody running track. So you got to be very, very careful. Lacrosse has a lot of equipment to protect you from right, that. Right, right. Um, two years ago, the high school rules changed where I think even college, where you have to wear specific shoulder pads that have a heart protector. Exactly. So because there have been instances yes. where somebody gets hit in the heart and uh, knocks off the rhythm of their heart. And some right? people have died of it. Exactly. So it's exactly. a good rule. The ball hits you. The referees are really, really good at stopping the game. But that's a protecting mechanism because the ball travels at such a great speed because of the strength and the, and the speed of these kids. Well, and, and the, the, the actual stick that helps to propel it that yeah, speed right yeah this is what it looks like it's a 40 inch stick by rule um the short sticks we call it play offense right typically and um you know they shoot different methods of shooting sort of like throwing a baseball and then the defensive players play with a stick that's six feet tall um it can't be more than six feet tall. six six feet six feet tall it's some um, 72 inches and um, it's designed for them to dislodge the ball from the offensive player so it's longer uh, but those Kids who play defense with a defensive stick, the torque with that long stick when they learn how to shoot properly. That's why I told you Cody shot 112 miles an hour with a long stick. Yeah. And that ball is traveling pretty hard if it hits you or if it, obviously if it goes in the net. You've got to be quicker than the goalies. 
Um, the goalies have different gear. They have chest protectors. They right. have you know big cups that they wear. They don't wear anything on their legs. I know. That's that's what I was wondering. They, don't they get hurt a lot with the get hit in the legs with those that, it, that ball at that speed? Yeah, it's interesting because all the goalies that I know have black and blues on their arms yes, and their legs. Yeah. But the reason they don't wear anything on their legs is because they come out of the cage. It's different than hockey. Hockey goalies stay in the right, net. Right. They got to move around. The cross players when they save the ball, right. they have four seconds to come out with the ball or throw it. And if they come out, they're like everybody else, they're free game. You can engage them. Right. So they have to be able to run. And if they have, you know, heavy equipment on the legs, sure. they can't they, run. Yeah, they're not going to be able to run. So most of them are pretty good with stopping the ball, not hitting legs, but the ball hits their legs quite a bit. Well, you've got to have a certain kind of individual that wants to be the goalie, right? Yeah, the goaltenders are a very unique group since uh, I played in high school, college. Um, you know, we laugh about the commitment from a goalie. It's a tough position because... I, yeah. Even getting hit with the ball, but when you get scored upon, a lot of goalies become emotional, and their second, third, and fourth goal can go in quicker, sort of like hockey. They be, they just blame it on themselves, right? And, and it's not their fault. And they lose their they, and, they, they lose their direction, I guess, or their yeah, their oh, I'm sure concentration, their composure. There. Yeah, right. so the concentration, composure, and they get on rhythm. So sort of like when they're hot, they make three or four saves in a row, they're outstanding. Right, right. But when they three or four misses. It becomes emotional, and when the game's over, it's harder for them to say, well, it's not my fault because I'm the goalie gave up 10 goals. Right. When you have defensive kids that might have a lapse, right. so it's hard. Some um, guy didn't stop the guy that exactly. should have stopped. And it's tough to stop this ball coming at you, you know, two or three yards from in front of you. Exactly. They get, they get very close to the goal sometimes. At times. It depends on, you know, strategies. Your, and, your defenders, it depends on. Yeah, right? like we played Moses Brown Saturday, and they packed it in where they – made a shoot from far, and if the goalie makes good saves, it's designed to make you, like basketball, the further you shoot, the harder it is to score. So, so what, what, that, what do they do? They, they pack the Yeah, they make the a goal? zone. They pack this on, on oh, defense. There's no, there's no, it's not like the, uh, the three-second rule in basketball, which they don't listen to anyway. They don't adhere to anymore. No, no, not you know, at all. In the paint, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, zone defense is designed to stop fast offenses. So if you're very athletic, our team's very athletic, they move the ball quickly. A zone is typically forcing you to take a shot that's From not further, a, out. further out that a goalie has a better chance of saving. So it's good strategy. Now, why wouldn't more teams play a uh, zone? It depends. So if you have teams that we call it can rip it, like wind up and shoot it, you're going to be susceptible for those shots that, you know, zone won't stop. So my team plays offense. I mean, so they play zone. They play man-to-man, -to -man too. It all depends on situational, who you're playing, matchups. You know, if you have a team that you think can, um, is very good at scoring from inside right. the lacrosse zone, two then you get yards, tight on them. Then you want to be tighter on them. Um, it just makes it harder for them to score. Plus, if you're putting six defenders inside the goalie, and then that means some of the offensive plays in, the chance of the ball hitting one of them and not going in the net are much greater right. when it's a wide open field where it's, you know, a one on one game. So I wouldn't say it's a complicated game, but it's very similar to basketball where if you watch somebody pick and roll, and then you switch, right? And it's a very fast game. It's um, it's it's a really cool game to be involved in. How did it start? How did how did lacrosse start? Was that an Indian game? It, yeah, that's what a, I heard, right? It, yeah, it's it's true. It's the original uh, American game. It came right. from the um, Native Americans Native played Americans, it. Native Americans, yeah. Um, and it was where they did battle, so they would battle, and the winner would live, basically. So we would morphed the, in. The loser wouldn't wouldn't make it. Yeah, huh? wouldn't make it. So. You know, it's morphed into wow. this high-tech game each year, Division One lacrosse in college and other Division Two and Three schools picking up more teams to play. I think there's like almost 90 Division One schools in the country playing lacrosse here. Wow. Is, um, a friend of mine is the coach at Providence. I'm a former PC coach. He right. gave us this helmet. You see the Friars insignia. Um, that's each kid on the team. At Pretty PC cool helmet, that. I might add. Well, at LaSalle, the same thing. We have our own helmet. It looks similar to that, only it's got LaSalle decals on it. All the teams do. They look uh, very similar. That's a $250 piece of equipment. Is it really? Protects your face wow. and, and your head. Holy cow. How, yeah. many, how many players on uh, lacrosse team? Ten play at once, so this is what we call... <clears throat> ten plus the goalie or uh, ten total? Ten total. So there's one goalie, three attackmen. Their role is basically to be around the offensive end of the cage. So then there's six score. others. Yep. Then there's three midfielders who play in the middle of the field, sure. but they play offense and defense. Yep. Then defense plays defense. And then you have your goalie. So there's seven. 
and then there's a specialized position called face-off. So when, like in hockey, when they drop the puck yep. in lacrosse, they put a stick like this, the ball between my stick and yours, and the opponent's stick would look like that. Yep. And you get down, and, and the ref blows a whistle, and you basically fight to get the ball. And then the two wing players come in and help pick up the ball. So it's become an art in um, college and high school lacrosse. If you have a good face-off play, it's a specialized position, sure. they get you the ball. So think in basketball, every time you score, tip off. well, every time you score, the other team gets the ball. Yep. In lacrosse, if we score, then we face off again. If we get the ball back and score, we get the we keep wow. face off. So if you have a good face off person, sure, then you can be in. Um, you know, the more times you have the ball in any sport, yep. Or the more puck, times you go to score, the better more chance, chances anyway. The, yeah, the better chances you have in ways. Not always the case, but most of the time. It's a great game. It's um, I. I as I told you earlier, I went to LaSalle. I was a baseball, baseball, basketball kid right. growing up in the city. I never saw a lacrosse stick, never saw a game. <laughs> and someone said, try this. And, you know, I didn't, wasn't that good at it for a year because they didn't understand the eye to hand. But once you learn how to play with it, um, it's the best, fastest. You know, a lot of my closest friends are lacrosse players. Uh, you know, well, you've got to be, you gotta be pretty agile and, and, you gotta be and in fast, shape. right? Yeah, there's no pushing back. You've got to run. It's right, a running yeah. Game. How long is the game? It's in high school, it's 12-minute quarters, so 12, 12, 12, and 12. 48 minutes. 48 minutes. In college, it's 60, 15, 15, 15, 50. Stop oh. time. So it's a, it can be a long game. It's um, strenuous, physical. That 10 play, but they can't keep up that pace. So, for instance, when you're on offense and you yep. have the ball, there's three attackmen and three midfielders playing. Yep. While that's happening, the they're other end of the field. switching off? Well, no, the other end of the field, there's three defensemen yep. and three attackmen, but not playing. They're just watching because the ball's at this end of the field. Sure. But when that changes, that ball comes up the field, they turn into defenders, attackmen on the other team, then midfielders. And those people rest, but the midfielders who go and transition up and down the field. Are, are there all the time? No, they can't. It's impossible. Because yeah. they're, they're sprinting. They're off the field probably every 30 to 40 seconds, unless they get on the offensive end and they can rest where they can stand still. Sure. But if the defense pressures them, they got to run. So you have to substitute quite a bit. So um, 10 start, but any good team, you know, 20 people play. It's like hockey. You rotate lines. Right. And there's a... During the game, they can come out. Like in basketball, you can't come out. But in, in hockey, you can. You move people on the fly, we call it. Right. So you come off, we put a guy on. Sure. But you don't do that typically on defense because if you, if you take a defensive player off, it'd be six on five offense, and the offense could take advantage of it. Sure. You usually substitute in the offensive zone when you have the ball. Yep, yep. There's no shot clock. In, in college, there's a shot clock. Professional, there's a shot clock. How, um, what, how long is the shot clock? Shot clock's 80 seconds in college. 80 seconds. And if it hits the goalie or the post, it resets to 60. So it, um, I think high school eventually will get to shot clocks, but it doesn't have it now because the high school, some of them can't afford, you know, the, just think of every high school in America being mandated for shot clock right. to put shot clocks. And then not only shot clock, you've got to have somebody operate the shot clock. Though. Yes. And somebody, you know, competent to do that. Because right now at the, at the table where the scorebook is, we right. have volunteers that typically students at your school for the home game, they keep care of the book. And they have to responsible clock. It's a big responsibility if you're not paying someone to do it. Right. And it's you know young. And they got to pay attention. Yes. They can't be on their phone. They can't be texting or nothing. No, and they're pretty responsible. <laughs> they keep statistics, which help us. You know, let us. You know, if they if they miss a goal, they're the official scorer. Much different than you know you see high school. I don't know what hockey does, but I've seen high school basketball. You have 20 different people scoring the game and. Um, you have a clock right in front of you. Not all places you play have a scoreboard. scoreboard. Right. Most do, sure. but you know sometimes it's sometimes it's just a field, right? It's a field, and you know you have to ask what's the score, and they might have a a, a digital where it says one nothing, two nothing, right. two one, right. two two, right next to you. you can see it. But that's so, as good as the person doing it, and the referees stay on top of it. Well, the games I see, most of them may end up in a in a ten to twenty score range. Yeah, Bob, that's what the excitement is. Like, even, you know, I've you know, watched soccer. It's one nothing. Two, I don't two, get soccer. I, I just, I just yeah. can't go and a whole game. And, and what, what, what I really don't like about soccer, I'm sorry, folks, is that you can go through the whole game, nobody scores, and then they have a shoot-off. Yeah. And the game is decided on somebody who's the better kicker in, in the end or, or who's, who has the, uh, the better goalie in the end versus – a game that you just play. Yeah, I think that's the allure of lacrosse, that it's physical, it's up and, and down, and there's a and lot of scoring. And people scoring. 
you know, the state championship was eight to four this year, so it's not a huge amount of scoring because it was a technical game. Right. Like I told you, Moses Brown played his zone, so we adjusted and we, if they're going to go slow, we slowed it and we had to be methodical and make so sure we're So you play taking, zone too then? You, you know, we have to play zone offense, but you want to be methodical and get good shots. You don't want to rush because the zone right. is designed to make you rush, turn the ball over and get them to score on their end. So the scores, you know, 15, 12, it's exciting. Right, yeah. And the kids, if you're young, then it, it just entices them more because there's some reward exactly. to that's, it. Well, that's what I mean about... Um, yeah, and, and I love soccer. I'm not, I would never say, but it's a different sport. So lacrosse, up-tempo, fast. Um, it's physical. Um, they've taken the hard hits out of the game, which I think is important because this doesn't always protect your head from concussions. Right. So yeah, because there's a lot of checking. There used to be almost like checking in, in, in hockey, right? Yeah, when I was younger, they had certain positions. That job was to knock that person right, over. Right, yeah, the enforcer, right? Yeah, and so that's changed, which I think is great for the game because it, you, know, you take out the best player with a, a dirty hit, it's just not right. Right, right. So and that's hits, what the intent was with some teams. Yeah, it was to just you know, the, to slow somebody down. It's just not right. And I always say to our kids, that's someone else's child. You know, I have a son that got concussed several times playing college. Um, I'm sure they all got concussed their own way, and they survive it. But you don't want something to debilitate them later down the road for sure. playing a sport. So the, the, the sport through U.S. lacrosse and college and high school federations have changed it quite a bit. Any hits to the head with your body or stick, they're penalties. Sometimes they call it lock penalties. So if you're locked in and you don't come out and the offensive team has not one more person Advantage. than you, and if they score two or three goals during that time frame, it's certainly – is a huge penalty to you, so it's really... And I how long, how long the is the lock penalty? It depends. It can be one-minute lock. The penalties in lacrosse are 30 seconds for technical fouls or one minute for non-technical. Blatant. blatant hits can be anywhere from one to three minutes in ejection. Like if someone uh, with intent to injure and the referees determine that's the case, right. uh, they can give them one minute locked, two minutes locked, or one minute, two minutes, three minutes, or three minutes locked. doesn't have to be locked, which, which means if it's not locked when the penalty's over... You come out of the box, right. or during the penalty, if someone scores, you reface off, and that person doesn't come out of the box, so that full penalty is enforced. That's a locked penalty. Yeah, so for instance, if you have a good face off person and you score, we call it man up, right. and then you win the face off, you, you score again. You could get three or four again. goals in that three minutes. Sure. That's the intent of the rule is to don't do it because you right. hurt somebody. And so right. that's, uh, I think that's one of the greater things that happened in the, uh, the rules committee to make sure that no one, and the game is so fast. And these kids are it so is. big. It is. I have a kid 6'7", 6'4", 6'4", that are athletic. Then you go to college, they're 6'2", 6'5", 250 pounds, athletic. You know, with and so to see the game at the speed, you know, referees to see it, you know, that you can hear the noise, yep. but you know, the holdings, the hooks, who, you know, who gets hit to the head. And sometimes people are falling in that collision. So it's um, the people looking out for the game I think have done a great job nationally to make sure that. Now, now the defenders with that long stick, don't they trip over that stick? No, they're actually very skilled with it. Yep. Um, it's rare. You'll well, see how about them trip. tripping other people with the stick? It's a penalty if you trip somebody. Oh, it is. Even if it's an accident. So if you get your stick around someone's legs, they fall. Right. It's a tripping penalty. Oh, see, I thought, I thought the opposite. So, I thought yeah. that, that was a... But you teach them different. You know, we, you teach them trying to keep the stick always up, not around the legs. Right. Because inadvertently, if you trip somebody, it's not good for your team. Now, the, what's the purpose of the stick being six feet tall? If they, if it's they, a good point. So this stick is, as I told you, 40 inches. Right. And so this third, this 70. And now, by the way, they call it a stick? Is yep. that what they call this it? This is a simple name, lacrosse stick. Different companies manufacture them. Right. But this is a shaft. This is the head. The ball can't be deeper than, you know, you've got to be able to see the, if the you can see the whole ball through. It's illegal. Right. The pocket can only be so deep. The long sticks are designed to give them a better chance to dislodge the ball from the short sticks. Because to take a short stick to steal the ball from somebody else is a lot harder. So the longer the stick is, the well, because they're, they're holding it up. They're, they're yeah, they're holding, holding it up. But you put it in on someone's body and you try and lift the stick up, check the stick, right. dislodge the ball. When the ball's loose, you know it's a scrum, basically fighting for the ball. And then you pick it up and you go back on offense or you go back to the other end. It's just, it's um, it's the way it's been designed since lacrosse started. So getting back to you, you started playing. Basketball, baseball, um, wrestling. Wrestling came after. So I was a city kid. I grew up about a mile from LaSalle. Um, went to Blessed Sacrament School, which is in one mile from LaSalle. 
My what was it? What school? Blessed Sacrament School. Oh, yeah, yeah. I remember that. Sure. So back when you had St. Edward, St. Thomas, Blessed right. Sacrament, St. Augustine, St. Pius, they're all regional schools, yep. big families. And so all yeah, I went to St. Mary's in Pawtucket. Did you? Yeah. All my, my parents' centers there. Um, that's a cost. It wasn't the same amount, but it's a cost to your parents to go there. Uh, my brother, oldest brother, went to classical. My sister went to St. Patrick's. My brother, older, another older brother, classical. Um, I didn't want to go to classical because I didn't want to follow them. Um, my dad said, you're not going to so Mount Pleasant. So you're a renegade. I was. And my dad went to LaSalle. And so, you know, I had to work back then. You know, I worked in a factory, mow, mowed lawns, whatever you did, um, anything to shovel, you know, just to make money. Yep. But, you know, I worked at Newport Creamy on Smith Street. Could, so I could walk from the south. Still there, isn't it? It's still there. My sister was my boss, actually. <laughs> um, but so baseball, basketball was all I knew, right. and football. And that's so I went to LaSalle and I played basketball for a couple of years on the freshman team, the JV team. Then um, my so freshman year, I got cut from baseball and somebody introduced me to lacrosse. Didn't play until I was a sophomore. And it was a pretty cool game. And then I got the bug. And then my junior year, I decided not to play basketball anymore because I thought if I made the team, I'd never play. Right. I was a you know, good player, but not at the level LaSalle was at the time. I wanted to wrestle to get in shape for lacrosse. Then I met a guy named George George. That's his real name. George George? George George was a wrestling coach at LaSalle, who's, <laughs> who's the most um, energetic leader you ever want to meet. Really? Teacher at LaSalle and wrestling coach. He wrestled Dan Gable in college. Everyone knows Dan Gable, probably the best wrestler ever. Right. Just this, and just got the wrestling bug. But I, my intent was to get in shape for lacrosse. So sure. my junior year, I was in like crazy physical shape from wrestling, because you just, the, what the workout in wrestling is just insane. It just, it really is a sport that's so unappreciated, because you, you work out like a maniac and you can't eat, because you're always keeping weight. Right. So. So you have to keep eating. It's mental discipline. No, you have to eat minimal. So I'd eat like a oh, hamburger. Eat minimal. Because you're trying to keep weight because everybody wrestles below what their real oh, body okay. weight is. Oh, okay. Right, right, right. Yeah. Just the way wrestling is. Oh, I thought it was the other way. I thought you were trying to get them no, to weight. No, no. You want to, because, you know, I, was a, I weighed 172 in high school or so. I wrestled 138. So, you, and so you're well below your natural weight. 172 to 138? Yeah, you drop, you know, a lot of it's water weight. Sure. And now that's all regulated. You know, high school is different. Whatever you weigh in on, you can only lose a certain percentage of that weight. But back when I wrestled, they didn't regulate it. But I use that as a tool for lacrosse. So my first day of lacrosse, I'm, if you ran four laps, I'd have four done by the time you did three because my cardiovascular was so sure. crazy. And so use that, learned how to play, and then I just got better and better. I uh, went to the University of New Haven on a part scholarship, played Division II lacrosse for four years, best experience of my life. But I wanted to go to the University of New Haven because I wanted to be a state trooper, and they had law enforcement as a curriculum. Right. Um, the famous guy is Dr. Henry Lee. He was the well-known person from the University of New Haven. Oh, isn't he the guy, that, the forensic guy? He was from the OJ. The, yeah. He's the blood spatter expert. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's the guy that handled the, the son of Sam. Uh, yep. Case, too. Yes, he's... Um, Him and the guy from Rhode Island handled it. By the way, Rhode Island had something to do with the c catching that guy. Yeah, I'm trying to think who it was. It's not coming to me. But that's what I did. I went to college, played, and then when I got out of college, I applied. Dennis Hilliard was the, the guy. Dennis at, was part of the crime lab. Yeah. Yep. So I got, I went to, got out of college looking for, you know, I wanted to be a state trooper. Right. I applied when I was 20. I didn't get picked, which was, you know, fair, 20 years who old. Was the, who was the? Uh, Colonel Stone. Oh, Stone was the colonel then. Yeah, I got hired eventually under Colonel Stone. Oh, you did? But I was 20, you know, probably too young, not ready for the job, um, didn't make it. Continued, got out of college. Um, I shouldn't say um, but I applied for the head coach job at Providence College, lacrosse. It was open. Now, I assumed I might get a graduate assistant job or an assistant job. Sure. That's why I applied. And I remember the first day meeting a legend named Lou Lamarillo, everybody from Of course, yeah, yeah. Him. And... Um, Went home, told my father, look, I just interviewed, I don't know. I well, he was a hockey guy, Hockey, right? be developed, Hockey East. And he went to pros. He, he, he eventually bought into, um, financially, the New Jersey Devils. Yep. They were champions of the world. And then I think he's the Maple Leafs now. I still talk to him once a month. Do you? Yeah. I talk to his son. I want to get him on the show. So if you ever see him, I'll ask him yet. because he's, to me, he's one of the most, besides my father, the most instrumental men in my life because second interview, he put his arm around me and he said, Stay away from the co-eds. Back then, that meant the, the women Stay away from the in woman. college. <laughs> and keep your kids in line. And what? Keep your kids in line. He said, you're never right. a problem with me. I walked out, 
And then I met Jerry Alamo, who's like his alter ego. He's Lou's about 5'6", Jerry's 6'10". Yep. And Jerry's the assistant AD, legendary PC guy. Yep. And he said, I said, well, uh, what just happened in there? Like, I, I'm 22. Sure. I'm going to coach kids my age. So he said, you're it. So I had no blueprint for it. So, oh, uh, you didn't even know that he, they were making I, you the head coach? Well, he told me you're the head coach. And, I, and then he said, and he just kind of basically summary said, see you later. So I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> you're on your own. No assistant. I had a higher assistant and I had no experience except, you know, I played and I was a captain of my team for a couple of years. So right. um, we f lost our first four games. And then I went back to what George George taught me, the physicality. So we started training these kids. The yep. good news is my best friend today was a senior at Providence College and the captain of the team. My best friend since I was 14, was yep. a senior at Providence College. I worked with him and we just trained these guys. I used the words like barbarians and we won seven straight. Nice. Because the physicality in the fourth quarter, nobody could hang with our team. Right, because, right, right. They were dying out and your guys were still And it's a third year go. Division One program. So then I started the recruiting process and I stayed for four years. And, that, and then I got selected for the state police. So while I was doing that, I became a correction officer. Yep. I worked nights on, um, I became a local police officer so I could work, I worked midnight to eight, go to sleep, go to PC about 2.30, um, get a workout in, coach my kids, go to the office, recruit, do all the things you do, right. shower, go to work. Go to work. Every day, that's what I did. And then the state police finally took me and I went to Lula Murillo and said, uh, got to leave. This yeah. is my calling. He was great. And, you know, I re re retired. So after four years, I was 26. But I've made lifelong friends from that team. I was at the PC St. John's game a month ago with 10 of the guys I coached in the 80s. They were all, in fact, the field is named after a kid I play, that played for me. Wow. He made money in the financial markets and he yep. helped underwrite the fields up there. So this relationship back to the 80s with Providence College, it's um, it's like the coolest thing. My nephew played for me at LaSalle. He ended up going to Providence College. I have kids that played for me at Providence College. I'm sorry, at LaSalle that have gone to Providence College. Right. Um, you should know, too, we've coached probably over 50 All-Americans at LaSalle. Wow. Those kids have gone to colleges. They come back and watch the games. It's like it's a really cool culture. You know, 90, it's just you, you got to be around it. Of kids that played at the highest level. Yep. Um, Cody, as well, I the told camaraderie you. of the fact that you played like that, played together at such a high level. Yeah, winning changes a lot, you know, perspective. When you win, you know, everybody wants to be around that. And it's kind of unfortunate because people don't realize, you know, we may have won the last 11 years. Right. But the four years before that, we lost in yep. the semifinals and the yeah. finals three times. Wow. And so those things, you remember them uh, more. more. More than you remember the win. They do. My son Cody tells our team, arguably he was, his team was probably one of the best top 10 kids on the field at one time. They were undefeated his senior year. Is that, wait a minute, is that at Bryant? At LaSalle. Oh, at LaSalle. And they lost in the finals to a team that we beat twice in the regular season. Yes, exactly. And he explains to them the overconfidence, the arrogance that winning can create. So that's a, an issue that's really difficult to deal with because as I mentioned earlier, these are 15 to 18 year old young men and I say this respectfully, their brains don't work. Like, they, they're smart, but just the culture, the phone, right. everything. Oh, especially now. Them. I don't know if I could even coach now with, with, the, with the phones. It would drive me crazy. Yeah, they're really good with, you know, obviously they can't use the phone at practice, but, you know, they're learning a new life. They're 15. But it's the coolest thing watching this freshman come into school and coach them. You know, they're also coached by super other coaches in track, football, tennis. Sure. Like LaSalle's got some solid coaches across yep, the yep. board, so soccer. So they get different ideologies from coaches. They get different ideologies from teachers, different ideologies from deans. But it's very similar. And then, but they're boys. And they do just silly stuff, dumb stuff. And you got to stay <laughs> on them and stay on them. You have to repeat everything to them day in, day out. Right. And it's just because their age. And so, but we're trying to prepare them for college, either college sports, and those kids who don't play college sports, prepare them for college sports and then life after. after yeah. So we talk about death, we talk about drunk driving, drug driving, all the things that are out in the world that might impact them. Um, half of them- It might have distract them too. Oh, it's, it's unbelievable. You know, the vaping, the, the tobacco chewing, everything that's out in front of them and everything you tell them and everything the school teaches them is, said in a different way 
on the internet and in, in marijuana and other things. So right. I've had kids over the years say, what's the big deal, coach? Well, and then you try to explain to them, you know, the carcinogenic things that happen with sure. marijuana and also... Well, well, they downplay that in the, in the media. Absolutely. Uh, I fought, you know, in my professional life as a state police superintendent, I would testify. Um, I'll give an example. Providence College men's lacrosse. I went and talked to their team a few months ago. And you ask them how many drink and X amount of kids, you know, the most of them underage would put their hand up. Right. How many smoke cigarettes? None. Why not? Of course, there's cancer. Right. I said, go Google marijuana. Exactly. It's 10 times more carcinogenic than cigarettes. And none of them knew in this educated world they're like, Exactly. Oh. So uh, those are the things I fear that, you know, I understand the political piece of it, the money that you make from it. It has nothing to do with me now. I'm not in the public foray. Right. But I try and explain to high school kids, plus if you do that, th that it's an NCAA violation if you're going to play sports. It, yeah, yeah. So you have a law that says it's okay, but you have a regulation at school that says it's not. And you might forget, and you smoke marijuana, your first offense, by a third offense, you it's a death penalty. You can't play anymore. Right, right. So trying to educate them. And it them stays in the system, I understand, 30 for days. 30 days, right? Yeah. And, it, you know, there's a whole different conversation to be had about that with drug driving, you know, and the police and what they're trying to do on the police level to police it. They can't police it because if you someone's can't, high, you, you don't can't know prove how. it. You, you can't prove it, right? No, and there's, they're trying to design testing for it. Um, that's, that's what you want to invest in when you get that because, you know, it's, they call it nanograms, how much. But what is intoxicated level for marijuana right. different from 08 with alcohol? So we teach them about alcohol, drugs, chewing, cell phone use, um, pictures on the Internet, um, words. You know, some of these kids really don't know what words mean. You know, words have multiple meanings now. And Especially on texting. You can say the wrong thing really easily on texting. I've done it purely by accident. I sent the governor a, a text one time, uh, you know, well, uh, audio text, you know, you're just talking to the phone, right? <laughs> yep. And they had to fall out a word in it. I didn't know it. <laughs> we just talked earlier on camera about the flip phones because, you know, you know what you're saying. But same thing. I mean, there's, there's so many uh, obstacles in these young people's way that that's just part of our role as a teacher, as a coach, to try and to teach them the best of our ability. I try to explain my background to them, you know, yep. how we grew up. And then we didn't grow up hard but different from them because they, these, most of these kids drive to school if they're 16 right, or better. Right. I didn't have a car when I was 21. They can't fathom that, right. and the car I had hardly worked. And they can't fathom even not having a bus to take them to school. I never saw the inside of a bus all through high school. Also, grammar, never, never, not grammar school, yeah. not junior high, not high school. And, and these kids that I coached, not, uh, because part of a team, uh, most of them don't work during the spring. Some of right. them have jobs, but not during right. the spring because it interferes with the sport. And, you know, some of them have to hustle to make money to let themselves go to the school. And I have to be cognizant of that, that I had to pay, help my dad pay for school, right. so I had to work. But I worked at the school. That's how I paid tuition at St. Mary's. I worked at the cafeteria every yeah. day. And there's a lot of LaSalle kids that work at the school, you know, to help pay their tuition. Yeah. So there's, a, there's just so many things thrown at high school kids. So different, I think, from when at least I was in school, you were in school. And then trying to close that gap. That's where, like, Cody comes in. Cody's 30. Right. Well, he's young, a lot younger, and, so he, and, breaks, he breaks that barrier. And he barrier. can explain to them that these things only happened to me 10 years ago as a young adult. Right. And these are real. So when I explain it to them, it's like they're, you know, I'm even older than most of their parents. They get it, but they don't get it to the same way when a guy close to their peer group. Sure. Yeah. And then the good part is these kids who come back that are freshmen in, high school, in college or sophomores, juniors, they all come back and talk to our kids. And without question, they say the same thing, the same message. Without really? me, I don't say a word. They just come in and say, this is my experience here. This has got me ready for college, especially right. if you're going to play college lacrosse. It's coach's job. Coaches doesn't win in college. Eventually, they lose their job. So coaches don't want headaches. They want a good kid, right. a good player that can help them win. So if you're going to be a kid that distracts that, they're going to let you go. And it's, it's not fun. So trying to explain to a 16-year-old kid who's committed to college while he's a sophomore right. or he's a junior at, at a school. At high school. And you, it's, well, I'm going to this school, but that school is projecting you to be something two years down the road, right. academically, athletically, and then socially. Those it, are the three. Yeah, and that could change. Well, it has in many cases changes. Messed yeah. up a kid for life. Changes programs. Yeah. You know, programs can get canceled. So nobody in any school is immune to it. So that's going back to your question about winning. I know you're pretty, really successful at baseball. It's hard. I think it's harder to win than it is to lose because to, to get 
you know, we have 37 people on our varsity team and 25 on our JV. It's part of a program. To get them all to agree to go in the same direction is really hard to it's do. It's virtually impossible. Yeah. And it can be done because if you, yeah. you know. They got to buy into it. They all have to work. buy into it. And that's, what, that's where it comes to the point where you say, well, this kid ain't going to. This kid's counterproductive, and this kid's going to be a cancer on the team, and you got to... They do. You know, it's interesting. the beginning of the season, um, I have them fill out a form, and what are you willing to do to lead a, to a championship season? Not, really? Not a team. Um, you know, what are you willing to sacrifice? Sacrifice means, I'll give you an example. We had a prom Friday night. Right. State championship was Saturday. So you've got to sacrifice something, so I'm not going to stop you from going because right. that's a rite of passage. But, but you're, you're going to make the decision, you not guys, me. You guys got to be home by midnight. Oh, and they can go to the prom. Go to the they, prom, but right. I'm asking you. I, I can't make you right. dance slow with your girlfriends right. or your date. Don't jump up and down and go crazy because you're going to wreck your legs. What do you want to do? And for me, not it's once, I think, in 15 years, I've had a kid miss curfew. Really? And that kid didn't play in the state championship game. He sat in the bleachers and watched the game. Kids know that. And if you're the best player, I have to, I have to follow through. So now I have kids call me 10 at midnight, say, Coach, you know, I'm, I dropped my date off in situ and I sure. live in Richmond. And then they, and then I, I get them on the phone, but I also get their mom or dad on the phone. Because it's, it. well, it's not beyond a high school boy to trick their coach. So <laughs> parent gets on the phone. Not like I don't trust him. He's home. He's safe. And to me, and I say this has nothing to do with you. It's everything to do with everybody else after midnight that's on right. the road. And you could be as innocent as anything, you know, percentages, as you know, after, yeah. raised. So for a parent's perspective. Nothing good happens after midnight. Exactly. And so for me, getting those kids in, getting a good night's sleep, um, and then coming to play in a championship game on a Saturday, you know, 20 hours later, you know, it's a big thing. Instead of having them exhausted mentally and physically, because they have to be emotionally ready to play any type of championship game. It's just the way it works. Now, how many games a week do they play? We played 18 games this year, 16, um, 16, sorry, 18 games. We play 14 regular season games. So it's our league. We play everybody twice. Then we go out of league and play four teams outside of Rhode Island. We play IMG, which is the athletic factory in Florida. Right. They came up here. They were number 20 in the country when we played them. Wow. We play St. John's Prep, who's number 30 in the country. They're from Massachusetts. They're typically the state well, champions. That's always good playing a, a team that's Absolutely. better than you, or at least as good. Or as you. good or better. Boston College High, um, they rated as high as 13th in the country this wow. year. And then Cheshire High School, we played them. They were 13th in the country. They're dominant team in Connecticut. So we play out of league. So we give us four. That's 18 games. And then we had two playoff games. We had a semifinal game against Hendrickson and the finals against Moses Brown. So 20 games. In how many weeks? Um, March 20th, we start. First right. game is April 2nd. So April 2nd to June 2nd. Within eight weeks, we play 20 games. But you play 18 games in six and a half weeks. Right. And then playoffs, there's a lull because of Memorial Day weekend. Yep. So we got a buy. Typically, the top two teams get a buy. So we this year, our last game and the first playoff game was right. two weeks apart. So we had two weeks to burn, which is pro and con. The good part is that is our kids get to heal because it's a long season. Sure. Kids get hurt. But there is a downside to and that. The downside is not staying sharp. Right. So we bring in our alumni that played for us, a lot of them play in college, and we try and scrimmage them a couple times during uh -huh. that. And it's different because, you know, you're not playing with the same anger and energy. Right, yeah, yeah. But it's... But they're playing. Yeah, they're playing not against themselves all the time. Right. And fairness to us, the teams we compete with that get buys, they have the same problem. You know, because you don't want to play a team that could hurt your players, too. Not intentionally, just someone. Right. Right. And honestly, three days before the championship, one of our best players rolled an ankle. I didn't think he'd play in the championship. He did. Really? But he missed the last two practices because he had a sprained ankle. Now, he's, miraculously, he played. He played. And he and played he well. Okay, yeah. He, he was played good. well. Yeah. And then we lost another one of our best players, got injured in a game. It just happens. He got a hematoma in his thigh. You know, he got a knee to the thigh. Right. And, um, you know, it's a tough a knee to the thigh? Yeah, like, a, you know, some, Another guy by accident. Knee. Yeah, just yeah, you collide yeah. and the knee went into his thigh. Sure. And so, you know, everybody gets injuries, every team. What's the most common injury? 
common is fingers, shoulders, you know, tweaking shoulders because the collect connection. Well, they pop. Yeah, so. sometimes they pop um, fingers because you get hit in the hands and you have gloves on. Sure. Sometimes elbows, mostly bruises from getting sticks or balls or getting knocked. You know, every kid's knees is all bloodied up because they're all on the ground half the time. <laughs> we play on turf. And they don't wear, they don't wear pads on no, their knees they got to run around for a lot, right? No, I've never seen a lacrosse player with knee pads. <laughs> <laughs> Unless they have a bad knee, like an ACL. Yeah, yeah. But the fear is concussions and ACLs, you right. know, those things that happen. And the wear and tear, like a meniscus, those little things you talked about. Right. But, but the big ones are concussions and MCL, ACLs. If they happen, you know, they're career-threatening. We lost um, one of our best attackmen. He's a soccer player. Most of these kids play two sports, at least. Yeah, and of I'm course. I'm going to tell you an inside story about a four-sport athlete. But this kid running down the field, nobody near him, ACL, gone. So he missed Nobody was near him. Not even close. Most of the time, the ACL is just running down the field. You plant. And well, they, yeah, they, yeah, they catch something. Though. Yeah, it's just the luck of draw. But I have a kid on the team. His name is Brady Fisher. Four, four sports. He plays four during the one year. So he plays. He's a wow. football, all-state football, tight wow. end, state champion in football, track and field. He was a 4 by 400 champion. He does the high hurdles, long jump. He did the pen, pentathlon this year. He never did it before. Came in fifth in the country. Holy cow. So he's all American. Yep. Then lacrosse, because we're a cut sport, he wants to run track because he did it last year. So we let him. So he practices with us. We do a ton of running. Then periodically practices track on his own, or he does with the track team, exchange of batons and timing and hurdles. Sure. So the day of the state championship for lacrosse, he ran four events in track during the day. He had to have his father drive him because he couldn't take the bus because the bus leaves well before him. Sure. His father dropped him off at Brown at 5.30 and the game's at 5.30. <laughs> so, no kidding. And he plays and he's a starter and he's a really good player and he helped us win a championship. So he's like this That's once, a phenomenon. In, once in a decade sure. athletic kid. Sure, sports. And he's going to go to prep school to kind of figure out, he wants to play football at a high level, but he's so fast, but he's a good teammate, he's a good kid. Um, and it's very unusual and I have the kids buy into it too because sometimes he misses practice to do track. I'm like, and my thing is nobody misses practice. So you guys, That's my game right there. But I said this kid's special, and it's as well, a coach. Well, he's not missing it because he's goofing off. Right. He's doing something that's good for him, good and for good his for the team, because the track, you know, points matter. Right. So he's just um, eventually, you know, I think television besides this will do a story on him. He's just, uh, I don't know what his career will be, but if he if he felt played just played lacrosse, he'd be looking at the top five schools in the country based on his wow. speed, and obviously his skills would increase dramatically. Tough to defend because he's big. He's 200 pounds, six foot one. And kid. like you said, he's fast. And speed in any game is always good. Yeah, yeah. Oh, he could be a wide receiver in football. Yes, and he's, um, you know, he's got that edge. And then the, uh, the football coach used him this year on defense too. Right. You know, when I watched, remember watching the championship game. Defensive and last, back. Watched or... three minutes. He's out there because he's so fast and he's got good. He's just a champion kid. So for four years, think about he played. Four sports, so he played 16 sports. That's ludicrous. That's and nuts. At the all four level. years he played four sports. He played. Yeah, he. I've had him for four years. Well, he, he had the COVID year, that was kind of a half year. He played four years, so he's got at least one football championship, multiple track championships, all American track, four lacrosse championships. He's doing all right. Wow. But he earned it. I mean, and to me, just watching that unfold, he had to be exhausted after track, and you, lacrosse is, you probably do like six or seven miles during the lacrosse game just going up and down that field. In the same day? Same day. He looked tired after the game. I'll bet so, he so. did. I'll, I'll bet he did, my yeah, God. No, special, special type of athlete. He, LaSalle recognized him as the athlete of the year, too. Right. You know, amongst a lot of really good athletic kids at that school. I used to have uh, uh, the hour Bob athlete of the year, male and female, and I don't know why I stopped it years ago. Well, it was getting costly because I buy the trophies. I have this big thing about it. One year I picked a kid from East Providence, um, Silver. Oh, the football player? Yeah. I know who he is. He ended up in the Super Bowl with the Colts. He was here. I give him a, I give him a trophy like this big. He was a high school kid when, when he was on the show. Yeah, there's a lot of um, athletes in Rhode Island that sometimes get overlooked whatever sport they're playing right. because... Because they say, oh, Rhode Island, they're from Rhode Island. Yeah. And that's honestly, it's one of the reasons we go out of state to play. When we play, like IMG is a nationally run team, and it was 6-6 at halftime. We ended up losing to them 12-9. But that gives people pause. You know, like if in St. John's prep, um, you know, we lost to them by a goal in overtime, and we should have beat them. We had them by three goals right. with a couple minutes left. 
but they went down, or well, no, Boston College, they had beat Boston College, Boston College High went down and beat Fairfield Prep. Fairfield Prep was 13th That's in the country. That's a big team, yeah, yeah, Fairfield, I know that. That's in Connecticut, right? Yeah, so, you know, if we're getting around playing those teams, give you, we played St. Anthony's, number four team in the country several years ago. So those are the things we want to expose our kids because when they only do it once in a while, they think, oh my God, it's the Long Island kids or the Maryland kids, but these kids can play. Yep. And there's a lot of good football players, basketball players, track stars um, from the male end of it, the female end of it that can play. And they go to different places and compete at, at the highest levels. And right. I think it's um, the more you can honor those kids because all of them are really good students too. And that's the whole idea, student athlete. Right. Well, my, my niece, actually my, my nephew's daughter, she was uh, uh, not only all state in Rhode Island in fast pitch softball, but she was also at Ponagansis. She was also the Gatorade Player of the Year twice in high school. She went to Hofstra this year, and she, they were playing against uh, national ranked teams. You know, the, it, they went on their schedule, but they, you know, the coach put them against uh, Miami and. Uh, um, yeah, top teams. Top teams in the country to play against. Now, a friend of mine who was, um, his daughter played a, a softball, Moses Brown, uh, she went to Arizona State, and, and she's pitching against the best players in the world. So, yeah, I mean, and not even if it's the experience of playing against the best players, but playing in college. The percentage of kids that play after high school is very, very small. Sure. But you have a lot of athletic kids that go into Division One, Two, II, and Three, and play sports, and then relationships they build and the connections they do. That, that's huge, that's huge, it absolutely is. huge. And if I, my, as an employer, you know, if I'm looking at someone's background, I'm looking for your education, I'm looking for your sports background because sports is discipline and it's also team. So if you're on a good team, you already know how to be a team wherever you right. work. And that's, you have to coexist. Um, and, you know, candidly, if I have 65 kids in my program, I'm conscious that they all probably don't like each other. 65 sure. people in the workforce, but I said, you got to figure it out because when you go to work somewhere, you might not like somebody, but you have to work, you with, them work with them for the common goal. Right. So, you know, they put that stuff aside. You know, it's sometimes I'm, I'm sure. Out of necessity. It. Yeah. But yeah, it's the team aspect that was going to make them better people. I have a, a kid who was um, up for academic All-American. He's um, 102 is his GPA and he has a 4.8 uh, um, adjusted weighted cum. <laughs> You know, so I think if I added my four high school careers, I might get a 4.8 total. <laughs> but the talent of these kids, and then you look at his bio, he's community service, this club, right, that club, right. National Honor Society. They're, they got so much going on. That they're not goofing off. Because, yeah, and they're busy. Because but they're, they're busy all the time, so they're not messing exactly. up. Yeah, and it's, so it's, so it's re pretty rewarding, that piece of it, the academic piece, but the social piece. Um, we take them to Chad Brown every year and do a toy drive. It's just epic to watch them, watch the faces of these kids. I'm trying to explain to them a lot of these kids, like us, if you gave them a cross stick, like that would be like you're making their day. Oh, and the, all, these all kids, more than the yeah. day. Yeah, and it's something for them to understand what the real world is, because right. honestly, every high school is not the real world. It's not, you know, the real what happens. So it's our job to expose them to things. I'll give me an example. We had a Chad Brown uh, alumni event every Christmas. I take them down from alum I've met over my entire adult life from growing up to policing to law enforcement. And I get a call from a barber in Smith Hill. We're going to do the event at his place. He said, uh, Colonel, just cancel you guys. There's, everything's roped off. There's just a shooting at the 7-Eleven. So I'm with 30 kids about to bring thousands of toys. I explained to 30 kids the reality of a mile from where you go to school, not sure. even. They just had somebody shot and you can't go down that street. And so I actually wanted to bring them, I didn't, to get them to understand that there's stuff that happens that you don't know because you live in you know, a different high school. Right. You know, that's, you You're know, not exposed to any of that. Exactly, and I, I don't want to expose them to violence, but I want to expose them. Well, you gotta expose them to reality. Yeah, that the world is out there because they're not watching television, they're not watching mainstream things like right. news. Right. If I asked them if you watched the news last night, they look at you funny or <laughs> newspapers. So trying to teach them to pay attention you know, that there's a lot more going on in the world than, you know, the educational piece shows them. That's, you know, that's, I think that's jobs of coaches and teachers in general. I can remember coaching, and my big thing was, you don't miss practice. You miss practice, you're not playing. That was, the, that was because I figured my, all the other kids have got to be there, and I got to be there. So if you're missing practice, you're, you're messing up the team. And I had this one family, it was two brothers, 
and they were both very good players. And I had to told the mother, the mother I understood, she said, oh no, they, all the other coaches that they've had coming up always let them get away with not having practice on Saturday. I said, well, that's not me. I said, if I got to practice and these other kids got to practice, I cannot let your kids not practice. Well, we do that. We, she went to the league to you know, get some kind of an exception or something. I said, can't happen. I said, if they don't show up on Saturday, they're not playing on Monday. And she defied me. She thought she was going to make it happen. You know, she went to the president of the league and everything, and uh, he backed me up. Monday came. One of them was my shortstop. The other one was one of the star pitchers on the team. I sat them both down. And she come flying over to the fence when the game started. She goes, how come my kids are not playing? I said, I explained it to you. I said, they didn't practice. My other kids did. How can I put them in the game, start okay. the game? I can't do it. So that just went on. It was the first time any team, any coach had ever traded. I traded both of them. It had never been done in the, in the senior league. But, you know, I think it's, um, I'm glad you did, and I wish more coaches would. One great thing, because many about LaSalle, that's one of their rules. You miss practice, you can't play. There but you go. That's simple. And so we've had, for whatever it's the reason. It's not fair. It's, it's not fair to the other kids. It, it's true. And, and so whatever the reason is, you know, now if you have like a death or something, that's different. No, of but course. You, I'm, I'm going to miss practice because of this. So at work, I'll give you an example. If you, you, you have to work on Saturday, but you can't make practice. Now, you understand the necessity that kid might have to work. Right. But the school's philosophy is school first, academics, team second. You bought into it by joining that team. So, right. And I agree with that. I, so there's always um, an out, outlier right. for that, but you're right. So if and then everybody else sees, and you can hear this again, if you give that person, well, you, it's okay to hit and play, you're going to hear about it a week from now because you let so-and-so do it, and it's okay for my kid. Now, Ken, we don't talk to the parents about why a kid misses, because if a kid misses and it's private, it's nobody's business. Right. But no, a kid misses once and for, for obvious reasons. Reason, but we don't share different that with the other game. kids. You know, if a kid's not at practice, I'll say so-and-so not at practice, but he's been dismissed by me. But if he's not at practice because it's a reason that's not you know, feasible for it might be work or whatever it may be, that's a coach's decision, and the school supports it, and it's a school rule. Even, even greater, during your season, uh, like you go on vacation. Like uh, spring is the best example. So it typically happens to the young kids in the little salary rule book or school handbook. It says uh, school vacation. If you go on vacation and you miss whatever you miss, you have to miss the same amount when you come back. So say you miss two games and three practices. Right. You have to miss the same when you come back. So you miss two games. Good. Then you miss two more games. And so in that two-week span, everyone's miss. getting better when you're not. You're not. And so... And then people don't read the book. So I've had parents come up to me and say, listen, my son's, we're going to Bermuda school vacation. I'm like, he, 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 he's not supposed to. Well, we've booked it for a year. That's up to you, but yep. he, there's a penalty that goes with that. Not being punitive, but those are the rules. And what it's trying to teach the kids, the yeah, that team first. So you decided to play, say, basketball, football, lacrosse, then that's part of the rules, that you just can't disappear. Because what happens if every kid... Goes on vacation. You don't, yeah, exactly. You don't, you don't feel the team. Do you know, like, what if I go on vacation during the middle of the season? Yeah. So I think that's, to, <laughs> to me as a coach, that's a really strong thing for me. You know that you've got someone supporting you behind. And they're, they're actually stronger than I am. They'll say, look, you missed. You, you have to tell them. I'm, I'm okay with it. But I just think that's a really powerful part of sports. Team, everything is team. And that's why I think the good teams are successful because they have rules and you, and you enforce those rules. And, and like like you said, somebody's got a legit reason. But this in this case, this woman was yeah, always uh, catered to all the way up from the minor league, little league, and she gets in the senior league. She, her kids end up on my team, and she's gone through the little league and the minor league. And every coach had let them not have practice on Saturday because she had something else to do or something. It wasn't like a one-time thing. Well, it's typically the younger ones, the freshmen coming in because their first indoctrination is to your point is in rec lacrosse or rec sports in general coming into or even competitive coming into high school whatever those rules are they that high school supersedes it so say it's providence high school or sal pcd whoever it may right. be now you come in a new rule and i'll give you an example we'll have parents reach out to us say what time's practice and it's a simple ask your son because it's part of their growth <laughs> good but, good but, but up to yeah. eighth grade they're yep. not navigating their schedules for them right. but the day they walk into that school ask your son or it's raining so we move the practice to an indoor place 
Well, I didn't know about it. Well, that's okay. I, you ask your son. Ask your son. And so that's the, that forces that communication because, you know, especially boys, they're not really good with communicating with their parents. <laughs> and that's coming from my parents. <laughs> but I think that freshman year of indoctrination is, and it's part of it is to have them grow up, take a little responsibility because yep. they're going to be in a car in a year driving a car. That's right. Big responsibility. So part of the growth in high school is you own it now and you have to communicate with your parents instead of the parents expecting a letter from the coach, like here's our layout. I give our, our itinerary to the kids, but not to the parents, and the kids gotta give it to, this is what right. the first week looks like, here's what the second week looks like. After that, I don't give them anything. Now, do you have a meeting at the beginning of the season with the parents? Yeah. Yes, we, um, we meet with the kids all year long, right. several weeks, and we just getting, you know, just keep them in. You know, Up to all, date. Yeah, yeah, and they all play other sports too, but season starts when we make cuts, so to speak, when we pick our team. We have a meeting with the parents and we talk about a lot of things. We talk about our, our style, our, same thing I just talked to you about, that they're going to be communicating with you, not us. Right. I opened the door this year to the parents. I said, anytime you want to call me, I'll talk to you, except about playing time. And if you call me about something else and it turns into playing time, which it always does, right. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to talk to you. Right, good. So the parents are pretty respectful. There's always stuff happening, but I found communicating with the parents because what I've learned over the years, the high school boys, at least at LaSalle, do not communicate well with their parents. Well, I think that's, I think that's no, did I. universal. <laughs> yeah, like I'm not telling my father I got in trouble at school today. Just right, not, yeah, yeah, yeah that's, not, that's not happening. So I think, you know, um, I've, I learned that last summer because I struggled with a, a player the year before who was just a great kid, but just in another place. Right. And by the time summer came around, you know, we were at odds. And when I talked to the parents about they had no idea. Oh. They just thought I was really frustrated with the kid because they right. could hear me verbally the way right. I was addressing him when they didn't know that he was not doing what we had asked him to do for a long period of time. So I, when those things, struggles happened this year, um, I'd reach out to parents. I know most let of them know ahead of just time. let you know whatever it's worth. Um, he's not really doing too well at practice. Right. He's, he's distant. His brain's not connecting with what one I'm doing. Typically, that's what's happened in the classroom too. Something you know, because they all have ups and downs. Sure. Got life issues oh, they have like something on the outside that's troubling. A girlfriend or something, some other thing. Yeah, girlfriends in the phones. Those are the oh, two. Oh, God, right? yeah. One and two, yeah. Yeah, and then, you know, most of them figure out how to navigate it, you know, and um, I'm around a lot of the, the girl lacrosse players. I got to know them because I helped them um, do some skill work with them. And I listen to them. A lot of them date the boy lacrosse players, and you just kind of listen. And um, it's, just a, it's just an interesting environment to be around. Um, like to, back to high school boys, I always say we're watching them from freshman to senior and then we become seniors and they graduate tomorrow. And, wow. and then you just see that metamorphosis and then the key is next year, whenever we play, when their seasons are over yep. in May, you'll have them in the stands or they come and help you. Well, they come to my practice and talk to my kids. Some of them help. They come and sure. help shoot at the goalies and work on face-offs and things like that. It's, um, it's, and they, again, I told you, they say the same thing that we say and some will say look I didn't get it when I was here I just didn't get it till I left right. because I went to college and my, as soon as my coach talked to me everything clicked but most of them understand what we're trying to do and the winning piece of it I think from your first question I think comes from them as a group somewhere seniors buying in because every year somewhere Seniors. They finally, it finally clicks. Yeah, finally not just clicks. the captains that are seniors. Right. The seniors, right. mostly the seniors that aren't captains, and some of the seniors that don't play much are become our best leaders because they're, they grind every day. They do the same thing right. everybody else does. Plus, they see everything because they're not on the field as much. They do, and they see, they like, know all the things that we're not aware of as coaches, right. the things that get kept from you, and then they become every year. It's by not. I sent a text to the seniors yesterday just telling them that you guys hit it hard. I know, I got, it. Yeah. I got it. I got it. I got your text. Oh, you did? I did, I got your text. Yeah. Obviously, it's meant for your group, but you say somehow I got it. Oh, yeah. So anyway, you know you just spent an hour with Bob. Do you realize No, that? I thought, I'm sorry, we... Wrap it uh, up. Yeah, oh, so, did I mention this? Did I mention this thing? You shouldn't, so I will. So if you didn't know, um, Bob got into, into, um, inducted, and that's not a good word to use, inducted in the Heritage Hall of Fame yeah, yeah. Uh, several weeks ago, um, very exclusive club that Bob's in, so congratulations on that, and that's the medallion that they've, they've given him. So that's from a lifelong achievement of, of just being basically a solid guy and talking to all the people like me that come in front of your show, and hopefully people get a chuckle out of our conversation. Exactly.
We had fun, and it's great to have you back again. Thank you. We're going to get you here again under, under some other hat. We'll figure it out. We'll, we'll do something. Well, again, thanks for stopping by. No, thank you. Always a pleasure. Yes. And folks, thank you for spending an hour with Bob.